again, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to, as Doug mentioned, our fifth webinar in our FASD series, five of six. Uh, the sixth one will be presented uh, on September the 12th. Um, I, I, in starting off, uh, before we welcome and introduce uh, today's speaker, I did want to um, thank everyone for taking the time to join us. Um, our webinar series has allowed us to reach out to hundreds of colleagues, uh, stakeholders, and, and so many participants across Canada, as well as far beyond our Canadian borders. The, um, the response and the uptake and the interest in the National Screening Toolkit has been, has been very, very positive and has really provided an opportunity for the steering committee and the, um, and the, the content experts who have really led the development process to really receive very important feedback on the current content of the tool. And that feedback, of course, is going to be extremely important as we move forward in improving and building on the current, um, the current material within the screening toolkit. Having said that, I wanted um, everyone to, to really understand that we view the kit as a work in progress. And your feedback uh, to the Medicine Wheel uh, tool that will be presented today, as well as to the other four tools that have been presented previously, is extremely important to this process. So again, a very, very warm welcome to, to everyone. Um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is not a diagnosis, but an umbrella term that describes the range of effects that can be caused by prenatal exposure to alcohol. These effects may include physical, mental, behavioral, and or learning disabilities with very possible lifelong implications. The prevalence of FASD in Canada is estimated at 9.1 per 1,000 live births. And the estimated lifetime cost for an individual with FASD is $1 million. As many of you probably are aware, in March 2005, um, our colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada endorsed the Canadian guidelines for the diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. However, the capacity of diagnostic clinics has continued to be low compared to the prevalence of FASD. And the majority of us online today are probably very much aware of that challenge. The validity and reliability of available screening tools. Um, when we started this work, um, developing our screening toolkit back in 2007, had not yet been systematically investigated, limiting um, further assessment and diagnosis. And again, that, that was the primary reason for, for the development of the National Screening Toolkit. In partnership with many FASD experts, and I'm certain that many of you have joined us once again on today's webinar, researchers and organizations, CAFC has facilitated the development of the National Screening Toolkit for children and youth identified and potentially affected by FASD. Today's webinar uh, will introduce our participants to the components of the Medicine Wheel Screening Toolkit, as well as engage you all in what we know will be a very important interactive dialogue, bringing together, once again, content experts from coast to coast. Um, it is truly my pleasure today to welcome, um, on behalf of CAFC and our uh, FASD Screening Committee, um, I wanted to welcome Dr. Lori Vitelli-Cox. Lori works in Elsipoktok First Nations, where she is a clinical coordinator of the Eastern Door Diagnostic Team, an Indigenous multidisciplinary diagnostic team for FASD and related conditions. Lori also works with school-age youth and their families through the Education Division and is Acting Director of the Nogamog Healing Lodge Program for Youth and Families. 
Lori has been very active in FASD research, diagnosis, and intervention many, many years. She designed the Medicine Wheel Screening Tools for Screening of FASD and Related Conditions, as well as the Medicine Wheel Different Game Cards for Intervention with Mothers at High Risk of Drinking or Drugging During Pregnancy. Lori is presently working on the development of a culturally safe diagnostic wheel for neurobehavioral disorders like FASD um, that it and, and is using the four-digit process within the context and framework of community culture. Broadening the diagnostic lens to also take into account pre- and post-natal effects of historical trauma. This has been used, has been in use rather, by the Eastern Door team for the last year. On a national level, Lori was one of the primary authors of the recent SOGC, the Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, Clinical Practice Guidelines for OBGYNs for the Screening of Women of Childbearing Years uh, Around the Use of Alcohol. Lori has also been on the teaching faculty of PRIMA, a train the trainer approach to teaching physicians, nurses, and other health professionals about pregnancy-related issues in the management of pregnancy. On a provincial level, she has been a member of the New Brunswick FASD Advisory Committee that worked through a series of provincial consultations to develop a model of FASD service delivery that the New Brunswick Health Minister recently announced will be implemented by an NGO at the New Brunswick FASD Center of Excellence. I have had the honor um, through the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers work in the area of FASD to work with Lori for several years now and really want to recognize her contribution to the National Screening Toolkit and her overall commitment and passion to improving the lives of children, youth, and families affected by FASD. Lori, without any further ado, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you as today's speaker. And uh, I'll turn the podium over to you at this point. OK, great. Elaine, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to everybody out there. It's a little bit disconcerting not to see you. <laughs> we can join each other in spirit as we uh, go through the, uh, the PowerPoint that I'm going to, my presentation. And I want you to feel free to think of questions and, and to um, write them on the board there for Doug, and he'll relay them to me. Uh, so I'll just get going right now. And I want to talk first about the framework of the toolkit that I use, the medicine wheel tools. And that, that's something um, that is, a, I think it's an important framework that is just part of First Nation communities. It sounds simple, but it's not very simple to work that way in our society that's very linear, and that's the circle. So it's, the circle is a sacred, it's a sacred way of working to all traditional people over the world, and it helps them make sense of the world. It reminds us that all of life is connected, continuous, and unbroken. And I think it's, it's what happens when you're, you're in a set, a sweat, or sitting in a circle, because you know that no point on the circle is better than any other. And it implies movement and flow, and provides us with a relational whole systems framework that's helpful for our understanding that life is not in a line, but that we're all connected. And it helps us understand and respect the relationship of all things within the system and also the need for balance. So I use, in Elsa Buktuk, we use the, the symbol of a medicine wheel. It's not native to Elsa Buktuk. The elders here say, um, they say it's, it wasn't here uh, originally, but they've adopted it because they had, they had symbols like that. And here's an example. It's the Micmac petroglyph that was found in Nova Scotia. Normally, it was a seven-sided or a seven-directional circle that people here used. But it's a very um, beautiful, beautiful petroglyph that you see there. 
So the medicine wheel tools grew out of the work in Elsa Book to First Nation. And it was, um, we've been using them in the Elsa Book to First Nation school for the last 13 years. Um, and also in the Eastern North Center of the Elsa Book to Health and Wellness Center for the last five years. So the, the challenges really of screening and assessment that um, we were faced with in Elsa Booktook had to do with the position and context of um, the First Nation community set in a community that was culturally very different. Uh, Aboriginal communities have unique uh, cultural and social challenges in terms of meeting the needs of their, their children. There's also the legacy of the past. And it's left many Aboriginal communities with high rates of unemployment and poverty, inadequate housing and education, substance abuse, family violence and abuse, crime, chronic illness like TB, and suicide. And really, um, when I first came to Elsa Booktick in the early 90s, the suicides, uh, the rate of suicide, there were there had been a series of youth suicides, maybe 12 or 15 in a period of only 18 months, and the community was reeling uh, with that. Um, Ivan Augustine, who's the principal, our wonderful principal of Elsa Booktook School, uh, he noted that the children in the school take their problems into the classrooms with them, and that children really can't learn if they're tired. They can't learn if they're hungry or cold, if they've been abused or feel unloved if they have unrecognized learning disorders, or undiagnosed physical or developmental or behavioral problems like FASD. The problem is that when children with unique educational needs who have challenging behaviors or difficulty in learning, when they're perceived, they're perceived as being problems. Um, the teachers perceive them as problems. The, their families, the, um, when they go to the drugstore, when they, wherever they are, um, their behavior is problematical, and they're not perceived as having a problem. And this is why assessment, screening assessment, and then appropriate intervention is so important. The other thing to remember, as well as the needs that are here, and this is something that I've learned uh, from the elders in the community, also learning to work in a circle, I have to say that's, that happened in the community itself. Um, that children in Aboriginal communities also have a legacy of strength, survival, and resilience, and that they bring the strengths of their communities um, into the school as well as their problems. I have to, um, although I told my husband to keep my house, I'm doing this in my house because in our, in our school, I can't get the internet to do this, it's too slow. I told him to keep our large dog out of the house while well, he's just opened the door by himself and he's here licking and he's getting a drink of water. So um, if you hear any strange noises, uh, it's my large dog, Angus. So, But they, they do bring the strengths into the, their strengths into the communities and into the school as well as their problems and they're really gifts to us. Our problem in the school is that the schools, school systems in Aboriginal communities are set up to reflect the terms of the larger society, and that success at school is measured primarily by a child's academic performance in the classroom, and this is in isolation to all of the other dimensions of the community culture. Now, traditionally, youth learned in the context of family and in the community from their elders, and the educational process was related to people's lives and to their place in the community and to activities that were meaningful and important. The relationships between people within the community, between the elders and, and the children that were the new generation, it, it was strengthened as the knowledge was passed down from one generation to the next. Compulsion in education, compulsory education was unnecessary because it was really a natural part of the individual's growing from child to man or, or woman. And there was really an integration of heart, hand, mind, and spirit. 
In the medicine wheel approach, the wisdom of the elders informs the scientific perspective of the professionals working in the school and community systems. There's an Aboriginal elder, Medina Marshall. Uh, she's from Eskasoni. And there's her picture with Albert, her husband. And she talks about two-eyed seeing, where one eye is looking through a traditional lens and one eye is looking through a scientific lens. The medicine wheel screening of tools developed from necessity because we could not find any culturally sensitive screening tools or culturally safe assessment that was appropriate to the range of needs and strengths that we saw in, in the school and in the community system. And it came really from the parents and the teachers um, who, who pointed out that there are many things that were interfering with the children's learning. Because when we first started this work, the school itself was really out of control. When you walked in the school, I think from the, leg from the legacy, from the, the suicides, from all of the things that had happened, um, there were the children were out of the classroom. There was crying. The teachers couldn't handle them. It was very difficult to know how to how to approach it. And yet, the, the children's strengths were really clear and and evident. So the medicine wheel screening came about when the parents and teachers said there are many aspects that are not academic that are interfering with the children's learning, and these have to do with their with, and it really was amount around the medicine wheel with their physical needs, you know, their their emotional needs, not academic at all, their family situation, their physical needs. And so we wanted to find a way of looking at the children's unique needs and strengths in a multi-dimensional way so that we could screen for complex conditions. Um, we wanted to focus on the family and community uh, as well as on the individual. Uh, when I came there were huge files on each individual child, but never looking at the child as a whole, never looking at them as they're embedded in the family and in the community. We wanted to use an integrated practice to build a community strategy, working together to deal with the, um, deal with the needs and the problems that we saw, and also to help the kids develop their many, many strengths. So in practical terms, what we tried, were trying to do was trying to identify needs in a way that was going to allow us to deliver appropriate interventions and help the children so that they could develop into all they could be. We didn't want any child to fall through the cracks, and hopefully all community agencies would be working together uh, to do this. So the medicine wheel screening for needs and gifts are, is a screening for needs and gifts. And, um, they're used, uh, I'll, I'll just show you how it's used in that way in this uh, whole system approach. We have the screening and diagnosis that takes place with the medicine wheel student index and develop, then the developmental history. Um, and then for diagnosis, we've, we've developed the, the trauma wheel and the diagnostic circle tool, which is a two-eyed seeing tool. And then for the intervention, which is post-diagnosis, we use the medicine wheel different, different game cards for youth. And for prevention, we use the community development tool and the medicine wheel difference game cards, which we use with high-risk moms and, and dads. So in the medicine wheel process, in stage one, we might use the community development tool we did in El Sabuktuk, um, and where community members map the problem and, and try to determine a community strategy that depends on their level of readiness. Um, in stage two, we use the medicine wheel index, and teachers identify the children who've had a severe level of multiple problems that are interfering with their learning and the learning of others in the classroom. They also identify the kids' other problems. Uh, it's a full range screening in, in the school, but this would be in terms of uh, the multiple complex problems that we would look at for then um, referring to the diagnostic uh, team and through the diagnostic process. In stage three, we would use the developmental history, and this would be a screening, it's a second stage screening for FASD or for complex conditions, and we, we would have the mothers of the children 
who screen positive in the first stage collaborate uh, with the community service professionals to tell us what occurred in the children's lives. And at, at that point, it's a, we also use that to get them on board in terms of, um, of looking at the kids' needs and looking at their gifts and then uh, getting them on board to help uh, in the healing, really, of, of the children if, there have been, if there's been trauma it, uh, you know, at any point. And in stage four, the children who screen po positive um, with the medicine wheel tools, the, uh, both stage one and two, are referred to the Eastern Door Diagnostic Team. And this would be for the kids that have now been identified as having a complex problem of pre- and postnatal trauma with exposures to alcohol, drugs, nicotine abuse, family violence, or neglect. In stage four, there would be assessment and diagnosis by health professionals, including uh, we have a, a traditional healer on our team, and then we use the uh, trauma tool in the diagnostic circle. And then in stage five, the individual and family interventions are carried out in the school and community. Uh, a very important part of our team is the family support worker because we consider family support as the treatment. There is no treatment as such uh, for FASD. You can't take a little pill and make it go away. But um, family support and the support for the, the youth are amazing in terms of the um, changes that you see and the, the uh, children can really develop and grow and, and flower. We've seen that over the last, um, the last years that we've been working this, in this way. And in stage, stage um, so we do a lot of outreach in that in stage five. And in stage six, it's back to stage one again where we get community input. We might go to the community again. We do that often for help. Um, it's, it's a process really of, of healing. So the other screening that happens with the, uh, with the student index, uh, it, because we, we, or even with the, the developmental history, is that for children that don't, aren't identified with complex medical conditions, we direct them to the appropriate service, service providers. Uh, so that could be a physician or a guidance counselor, uh, could be an educational psychologist, an OT, a speech pathologist resource program, the health nurse, because the, the teachers will identify all of the, the needs. You'll see when I get to the tool itself. So in terms of the community strategy, this happened. We started our work in the school uh, around 1998, 99, 2000. We started getting going, and we actually did the first diagnosis in the school before we had our diagnostic team. We had a physician that uh, came into the school. We were very lucky to um, have someone nearby who agreed to come, and he had been trained uh, to do FASD diagnosis. But we realized quickly that we needed to have some community way of dealing with it, and through the community meetings, we thought that getting appropriate diagnosis and assessment was really important. So this, the center started um, as a, first as a multidisciplinary diagnostic team for the conditions. And then we went into the other aspect of the strategy was prevention. And so we have also the uh, uh, women's support group and then a PCAT program and outreach support for the uh, moms there. And it, it, was it was formed in response to the high prevalence of FASD and related conditions that were found through the needs assessment uh, in the school. So the community members and uh, service professionals met together and we, we did the um, asset mapping and then also we found the asset mapping was to the elders were they were it was a lot verbal so um, they we made an approach that was uh, had to do it was very visual and we worked on it together in a, in a kind of visual way we mapped out um, the community's problems around the issue of, of FASD and then also strategies for for dealing with it. So it's, it is a visually based process to uh, map gaps in community and service um, in 
sort of gaps in service and then also the community strengths and to help determine the readiness of community members uh, in relation to how we wanted to develop a community strategy. Uh, in the community approach that we do, we realize that um, when we diagnose a complex condition like FASD that's caused by prenatal and postnatal exposures of an individual to alcohol, drugs, and trauma, that we are not only identifying the individual that needs support, but also the family and community that needs to return to balance. So this was the Eastern Door model as an integrated approach to assessment and diagnosis. And in that systems model, we have the screening, which uses the tools that we're going to be basically focusing on today. Then we have the diagnosis through the Eastern Door team, the intervention through family support program and the school interventions. And we have the Nogama alternative uh, for youth that have, uh, may have had uh, prenatal exposures or trauma and they're getting in trouble with the law and they're having difficulty uh, in school. And uh, we provide an alternative program that's very centered around working with the elders. We also have a prevention, as I was mentioning, with the PCAP program and the women's support group. And a, a birth to two head start home visitor uh, program. In terms of um, uh, prevention and intervention, uh, the different state of cards are used uh, for goal setting and needs assessment and um, motivation with pregnant women known to be using alcohol and with the birth moms who have had a child diagnosed with the effects of prenatal traumas. And the youth pack is used by the family support workers uh, for intervening with high-risk high youth, and that's post-diagnosis. So the Medicine Wheel Student Index in Stage 1 screening, it's a teacher rating scale or inventory. And it relies on teacher perception, which would be a psychoeducational tools, a psychometric tool like the Connors or the BAS or the Vineland would be, uh, would be tools that will, are relying upon teacher perception or parent perception. Then we have the Medicine Wheel Developmental History, and that's a semi-structured parent interview that we do, as I said, in collaboration uh, with the mom and with the parents, or it could be the Migajus or the grandmothers. In Stage 2, we have referral to the appropriate place, uh, and in the case for FASD, it would be to the diagnostic team. Stage three would be a diagnosis by the multidisciplinary team. Stage four would be the post-diagnosis intervention through the family support outreach workers. And they would also help the families and community agencies who are almost, it's very important to work with the community agencies almost just as much with the families and the individuals because you really need an integrated approach to helping provide the interventions. And it's a lifelong condition. So we work we're working towards that. And stage five will be the prevention outreach with the moms of the identified children and others who have substance abuse problems. So in the first stage of the screening with the Medicine Wheel Student Index, um, I'm going to go over the components of the student index. The index is composed of seven domains, and um, that would be the, the mind domain, the emotional domain, the physical domain, the social. Then we have spheres of learning, the special services that the children might be receiving, and then also a, a domain of the children that are non attending And for those children, we go uh, to the parents and do an, a, a parent screening in the, for first stage uh, screening. So there are 59 items in seven domains and subdomains. Uh, the first in the mind are ability and achievement, that has four items, neural behavioral, that has seven items. The next domain is social, and um, there's two subdomains that would be in school and out of school. There's the emotional domain, which eight items, the uh, physical with eight items, uh, spheres of learning, which have to do with the multiple, the children with multiple areas of need. 
the children with strengths, both creative and social. And that's a very important part um, of the tool to identify the, um, the strengths that each child carries because this will help in the healing. And then also the average, this, the, I put that in there so the teachers will make sure to identify all the kids in their class. You sometimes have children that they forget to mention. And then the special services um, that they might be receiving and the non-attending children. In the mind domain, the um, four items are um, literacy in terms of reading and writing, uh, language, expressive, receptive, and communication, social communication, numeracy in terms of math skills and reasoning, and ability, general cognitive ability. And this is in the mind subdomain ability and achievement. In the mind subdomain neural behavior, we have attention, focus, activity level, impulsive, impulsivity, memory problems, organizational problems, uh, difficulty starting a new task, task initiation, or difficulty with transitions. And these are, many of these are, uh, they're part of other screenings that, or other tools. It's, a, it's combining a way of looking that, again, would be the scientific way of looking in the accepted scientific categories with uh, a wide way of seeing so that you're, you're um, like Marlena Marshall said, you're trying to do a two-eyed seeing approach. So in terms of the social domain, um, subdomain in school would be, these would be the, um, the items, pushing, uh, no guilt after misbehaving, acts younger than age, work refusal, not respecting others, bullying or hurting others, lying, stealing, cheating, avoid social interaction, touch, eye contact, destroys property, breaks school windows. And these would be, um, you might see some of these in uh, the, uh, the neural behavioral screening, FASD screening tool. And I, um, you know, purposely had some of the criteria, you know, some of the, the item criteria be exactly the same so that we can actually see after a while, we can look at both tools uh, together. In terms of the social domain, uh, social, which is outside of school, we look at attendance, lateness, Hungry, tired, lack of warm clothes, smoking, sniffing, alcohol, drugs, trouble with the law, family problems, trauma, that would be abuse, severe grief, or violence. Because all of these are factors that work with alcohol exposure. And also we want to find all of the things that are uh, needs uh, for the children that are going to school uh, and to try to deal with them so that the, the, our main concern is that the children will be healthy and ready to, to learn and ready to develop and grow, as I said, into all they can, all they can be. Um, in terms of the emotional domain, we have aggressive, timid, depressed, sad, withdrawn, anxious or afraid, angry, defiant, talk or signs of suicide, affected by grief or oppositional. In terms of physical, we have fine motor skills, gross motor skills, coordination, vision, hearing, weight problem, speech, growth, very small or large for age. In terms of the students, then we have the students with multiple areas of need. This is a very important uh, part of the tool. It's where the teachers will identify in a kind of gestalt way the kids that they feel they can't get to. Sometimes the kids with FASD in, the, in their makeup, they, because they have like gaps in the, it, depending on when the mom was drinking or when they might have uh, had the effect of prenatal exposures, um, one part of their brain might not be affected at all, and then another part would be, you see this uh, series of highs and lows. So some of the teachers don't get it exactly, and they'll say, well, that kid's really smart, because they, they are. They have great intelligence in some areas, but then in other areas, they really don't get it. They may not have, uh, they may be able to express themselves but they don't understand very well. And so they, the teachers will say, well, they're just, they're just not paying attention. They're just not listening. But they get frustrated, and they, they feel frustrated because they can't get through 
uh, to the ch to the children. They just no matter what they do, and these are the kids I want them to identify in terms of the multiple areas of need. No matter what I do, I can't seem to get through to them. And I tell them that when they're when I teach them how to, you know, use this tool, and uh, they they can get the hang of it after a while. They, um, it's a little bit different from the what they've usually filled out, but they uh, it's not hard you know, once they get used to it. And then we have the students with exceptional stress and creative gifts, storytelling, art, creative writing, computers, music, mechanical ability, dance, drama, sports, traditional activities, sewing, hunting, handiwork. This is really the amazing part, and we don't have enough of it in our schools, but some of the kids that I have in our most, a lot of our psychometric tools are very geared towards the verbal. And a lot of the kids that have been affected by alcohol with FASD, um, at least in the population that I've been working with, they have a lot of the work, their, their visual abilities are very much in place. Now, this is not for all, all of them, because it depends on when the, the kids, but in, in general, from what I see, they have their visual ways of seeing things are in place. And their, um, their handiwork, their, their understanding with their hands, uh, is, you know, it's, it's one of their, it can be, it can be one of their great gifts. So it's, it's really important to uh, go through and get to all of their gifts. Music, art, um, it's quite amazing what the kids uh, can do. And then their, their social strengths, generosity, tolerance, patience, endurance, uh, responsibility, helpfulness, respect, relationships. And these are the, the teachings of the elders in the community, and it's very important to the community that we would look at these uh, as well as academic strengths in terms of the, ch the child's development. Then we have the other domain, services received or needed, and um, the non-attending children form, which is filled out with a parent or guardian, because we don't want to miss out on those kids that have unfortunately stopped coming to school especially those kids we want to be able to get. So the teachers identify them, and then we um, go out and try to do some outreach to get the parents to help us understand why they're not coming to school. And um, we have a form with a lot of the behaviors that the teacher's form has, and we fill it out with uh, the parents so that we could go into then stage two screening if we need to with them. So in terms of the scoring scale, uh, for each item within the domain and subdomain, the teacher assigns a rating for the behavior or development of 1, 2, or 3. In terms of the behavioral scale, 1 is mild or occasionally, 2 is moderate or often, 3 is severe, very often or fre very frequent, 4 is an exceptional strength. In terms of the developmental scale, 1 is less than a year delay. Two is from one to two years delay. Three is two or more years delay. And four is a strength, more than a year ahead. And this is done, uh, when I say less than a year delay or uh, from one to two years delay, um, it's done in relation to the system of all the kids in the school. So the teachers use their clinical judgment uh, to rate the children. It's not strict because if the kid, kids are in school and they have come in and they might uh, come from a home that is a Micmac speaking home or a home where the traditional language is used, then they would not, in, if they're learning uh, English or it's an English-based classroom, they're not going to, uh, in terms of literacy, they're not going to score them if they have, uh, you know, more than a two-year delay in grade when they're, uh, say, in grade two or something, and they're getting used to the, the classroom. It's taking into account that, and I work with the teachers on how to score when it's um, they have to use their judgment and I when I do the training. So the administration time, it takes generally 15 minutes to complete uh, once they get the hang of it. And um, the only papers, paper, materials they need are paper and pencil. And the forms include all the information and uh, administration instructions. It's the range is the entire school population from nursery to grade eight. I am working on a, a tool for uh, the earlier grades. The index is filled out by each 
classroom teacher, so the teacher knows the kids quite well. Um, the non-attending children form, as I said, was filled out by the parent or guardian with assistance. And the classroom teacher would have to uh, know the children for at least two or three months. If you, we do it every year, uh, and we fill it out at the end of the year in May or June, and then um, that way it gives us, the teacher really knows their students very, very well. So the information is not only used for the screening in terms of the FASD uh, or other com complex conditions, but it's also used for system planning in the school for the next year and including a specialist referral. It is helpful because sometimes teachers, what we had found in the beginning was that teachers were hesitant often or unable to refer children to the services that they might need. So this really um, allows for a routine annual screening of the kids. It doesn't focus on any one individual. And it's the full range of needs, as you can see, that are identified from mild to severe. And the kids who have severe and multiple problems in any area uh, are red flag. And they receive attention, immediate attention. And the, others are, the other kids are monitored. So the red flag children uh, who are identified with multiple severe needs, who screen positive in the first stage of screening, they would go on to the second stage. And again, this would be uh, the kids that have those uh, problems in ability, achievement, adaptive behavior, language, attention, reasoning, uh, or memory. So then the mothers come in for an interview, and we explain the procedure to them. We tell them it's standard procedure to gather information about the kids. Every year we do it. And that the teacher has indicated that there may be problems interfering with the child's, their child's learning and that we want to understand why in order to help the child grow and, and do well in school. We ask them for their help because um, we want to get the full history of the children so that we can help them in the right way. When we're doing this, we try to build a respectful and non-judgmental relationship with the parent that's based in the fact that the, the parents and the moms really do care uh, for their kids and want them to do as well as they can. And the moms and caretakers really become collaborators in the process and become their child's advocate. And we work with them to help them do that and advocate for their children after assessment in all of the systems uh, in the community and outside of it. So the developmental history, which is stage two screening, is a semi-structured interview that's for the parents, especially for the moms, uh, could be the grandmothers. Uh, it's administered by a counselor, psychologist, school, social worker, or nurse. It has to be somebody who's not part of the regular teaching or administrative staff because we ask very personal questions. If the informant uh, is unfamiliar with the prenatal birth or developmental history, um, then we ask someone in the extended family to collaborate with us. The developmental history is designed also to look at, uh, in a whole way, to look at all of the factors to, that are contributing to the learning problems. And that would be, again, around the medicine wheel, social, emotional, mental, or physical. In this, terms of the social history, we ask questions like about multiple placements, uh, family breakdown, special relationships the child might have. We're trying to get it, uh, attachment uh, issues. In terms of the emotional history, we ask about the history of abuse, uh, grief, or trauma. We ask about um, in cognition about language and motor development, family or learning problems. In terms of the physical history, we ask about the pre- and postnatal exposures to drug and alcohol, serious head injury, convulsions or seizures, lack of oxygen. This is all embedded in the uh, sort of in the process of the semi-structured interview. It's not done like that, and the um, it's just really trying to find out the information and um, and the, we allow the parents to tell us their story uh, as we're going through this. And 
they often do. They often it takes about two and a half hours to do it properly. Uh, and in terms of the, we also include the spiritual in terms of their relation to their traditional language and culture in terms of the parents' relation to that, and also any historical trauma that the family might have had, or their moms and dads, or you know medical conditions or genetic conditions that the, the might have existed in the family. We're trying to get out of get to all of the things that might be contributing to what we might see in order to make a differential uh, assessment, differential diagnosis when we get to that, that level. So um, we refer for a neurobehavioral assessment if the mom drank or used drugs during pregnancy, um, if she drank or used drugs before she knew she was pregnant, if she identifies as having an alcohol problem, if she was in a treatment program for drugs or alcohol, if she's had previous child diagnosed with a neurobehavioral disorder like FASD, um, or if the mother or guardian is, feels strongly that the child should be assessed for FASD or neurobehavioral problems. It's very important for us, uh, there was a, in the beginning, there was a, um, we felt, we went through a discussion about whether diagnosing and assessment of FASD was labeling. Um, we had to come to terms with the fact that we needed to do appropriate assessment uh, and diagnosis because we wanted really to prevent secondary disabilities. And without appropriate screening and diagnosis, we couldn't do the, we couldn't do the appropriate interventions that the, the children might need. And this, uh, this, these interventions are really key to the prevention of secondary disabilities. So here's our Eastern Door diagnostic team. We actually have a DVD now of our uh, team. It's called Two-Eyed Seeing. And, um, uh, the Aboriginal Health Transition Fund funded uh, for knowledge exchange, and I'm hoping that we can uh, get that up on the CAPC uh, Information Knowledge Exchange Network. And there's our team with our elder and um, other folks from our community, our physician and education psychologist, our nurse practitioner, OT, and we kind of, we didn't have money for funding it really. It's kind of patched together from the, we borrow the physician and the um, OT from the province and um, the uh, elders from the community and the nurse practitioner from the health center. Uh, the school provides the speech pathologist and myself actually. I, I, my, I sent her out of the school and also the um, educational, I, I, my PhD is in educational psychology, but I've started doing the clinical coordination of the team. And then the family support worker um, and our team coordinator are, well, the family support worker is funded provincially and our uh, families and our team coordinator by um, uh, First Nation and Inuit Health. So you can see that there's many people doing this and we get together Actually, once a month, we come together and we do our work through the month, and then we come together to help the kids. When the child is referred to the center, it's not just the child, but the family and community, as I said before. And we think of the Eastern Door as a doorway that really connects the individual and family to all of the wellness um, services and to the service providers in the community through the outreach. We try to focus on healing and rebalancing, recognizing that historical family and community trauma are often the root of the problematic alcohol and drug use. And FASD, the alcohol use, is only one part of it. It's, and I think when you look at it in this way, it takes the onus off of the mom. So this is a historical family and trauma tool that was developed uh, with uh, the cooperation of the elders and in the first, uh, the inside rung of the tool, which would be, um, you put the child's name there and then in the inside portion is the prenatal experience. This is the postnatal experience 
and then it goes back into the wider family of the mom and the dad. And in the newer version, we actually have M for mom on this little squares. It goes back generationally, and then D for the dad's family and experience. And sometimes you can see all the way through, we'll get pluses, you know, here. So there's been trauma generationally, postnatal, prenatal, and down through the generations. The same with the alcohol use. This, the smoking. This is our next tool. This is a two-eyed seeing tool that was done. It's based on the four digits um, system, which is the top half is the scientific, you know, which is used by all of the diagnostic uh, centers. It's um, the process that is uh, suggested in the Canadian guidelines, and that's on the top half of this tool. And that we worked with Sterling Claren a bit with that, who would be the elder, I would say the elder in our scientific world, one of the elders. And on the bottom half um, are the work that we did with the elders in the community, which are uh, all of the other kinds of factors, family mental health, suicide, incarceration, family violence, family sexual abuse, that were leading to uh, the conditions. And we find that tool very helpful. It happened, it came out of one of our diagnostic clinics. Uh, we had an elder there, and um, when you do the four-digit process, it comes in a square. And he said, he said, it, he said, why can't you look at it in a circle and include everything? And he pointed out with that particular uh, assessment that we were doing that the young girl's uh, grandmother had died, and a lot of the behavioral problems had become really serious uh, in the last year after the death of her grandmother, who she really was close to. And it just was like a, a rock in a pool, like a pebble. It just spread out to all of us on the team that reverberated, you know, just, um, I can't explain it, but it just was grief. Like, we didn't consider grief in our diagnosis or in looking at the, behavior, the behaviors. And so we wanted to include the elements uh, that the, the elders were seeing, you know, might be affecting, other than the alcohol, that might be affecting the whole child. So um, that I went home and I came up, I worked for a couple of weeks and then took it back into the team and to the elders in the community. And then uh, we, it, it's been a process, but it's, we've been using it for about a year and it's, it seems very helpful to us. So we use the medicine wheel tools for screening, diagnosis, goal setting, problem solving, um, giving us information for the design of community interventions, and based on the community members' uh, input. In the school, this screening, if when I go back all those years, the, the whole system in the school has changed. The school itself has become healed by dealing with the kids' needs in a, in a way that was appropriate to giving them interventions appropriate to what their needs were. The first thing we did was a hot lunch program because we realized that the kids were coming in hungry. And that's going really great. We just put in a community garden. Um, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's really wonderful. And all the kids participated in that. And it's in the shape of a medicine wheel, a circle. And the person that's um, helping with that is one of the um, is actually just graduated with her VED, and she's one of the graduates of uh, our one of our Nogama, Nogama program, where she was associated with it, and um, uh, someone else who is uh, in that program also uh, they just graduated with their uh, degree from college in carpentry, and uh, that's it's pretty wonderful to have that happen, you know, to see that. You really, by building on the gifts, the kids can really make it through and um, flower, just like little plants. You know. So then we, we also, the teachers wanted, to go on with this, um, the teachers wanted smaller class size and daily resource and literacy support, and we gave them the kids that because it seemed like the, kid, the teachers could really teach them better. We didn't want to isolate the kids that had any, any kind of problem whether it was FASD or whether it was difficulty with reading or 
receptive language disorder, no matter what it was, we want to try to keep them together with their peer. Um, we have a youth behavioral program. We have the Nogama Summer Camp and um, now the Lodge, Youth Lodge program. We have a um, Youth at Risk program, an alternative for the kids to drop out. Also, the Nogama program now handles that, um, as I said. And then we have the Eastern Door Center and Family Support. And all of this really came out of this uh, approach that came from the community itself. So what happened in the school was that it completely turned the school around. In 1996 and 7, before the interventions and the started, 80% of the children, grades 1 to 3, read below grade level. And since then, uh, from one year after the interventions were implemented, implemented from 70 to 90% of the children, grades 1 to 3, uh, who didn't have a serious issue were reading on or above grade level, which is pretty amazing. And the children now do as well or sometimes better than the children in the provincial school or and on the provincial examinations. There was a dramatic decline in school discipline problems and um, the youth crime rate actually dropped. We had an evaluator come in and do an external evaluation and um, we're just in that alternative, it, the project funding ran out. It was from Youth Justice, but it's due to reopen soon. Our only problem now is that our lodge burned down, so we're busy, busy, busy trying to, we have no money, so we're trying to build it um, as best we can. Maybe we'll have, for the first year, we'll have be in a, one of those, uh, a teepee or a tent home. So. But we also have fewer children leaving before they complete uh, the last grade of the community school, and more children are completing high school. Okay. We have an outreach support model for the moms, because the, we find the women who need it the most don't access the services. It's long-term. We try to be long-term because the problems are deep-rooted. We try to deal with all the issues that affect the health. That would be social, emotional, physical, and spiritual. And um, it's family oriented, including husbands and grandmothers and grandfathers. So this is one of the programs that have happened through this whole uh, system approach. And it's uh, not just, it's like a whole community approach. And this happened through the uh, health center and the, it's the uh, connecting the grandmothers with the younger moms. It's through our women's support group that it's cooking with the Migajus, which is a wonderful program. So this is the Eastern Door evaluation data. It was after the first year or two, uh, there was an evaluation of the health center. And they, we wanted to just see that um, what was going on there. So substance abuse, according to uh, what we saw, substance use during pregnancy. I don't have the latest stats, but it seemed that alcohol use certainly had gone down from the time we, we put the PCAP program into place in the women's support group. Um, our problem, though, is the drug use in the community is, is huge. And um, then, of course, you get drinking aside from that. And um, so we have a whole, the, the children are still affected. In terms of the cost, uh, Elaine was saying a little bit about that. You know, the calculation is that it, around a million or 1.2 million lifetime costs for a child affected by alcohol and trauma. That's huge. You know, it's about ten dollars to $20,000 a year. And if you think of, um, a, you know, just in New Brunswick alone, if you think of a 10%, uh, I mean a 1%, you know, rate, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're spending on kids that are uh, have been affected by alcohol and we don't have here we don't still don't have diagnostic services or intervention appropriate interventions although as Delaney said we're getting them it's pretty exciting so I want to leave you with just thinking about the fact that our world really is in our children's hands Thanks. Just some lessons that we've learned through this process. And that would be to make sure to take one step at a time.
and that we all can be windows for change. Everyone in the community needs a seat at the table. And it takes all kinds of wood to make a fire. And this is our young one that now has her VED after she came. She was part of our program, and then she um, became a counselor and a director and of our camping program. And um, young wood and old wood. And here's one of our elders uh, here who's just been wonderful in our programs and and um, here's another elder who was uh, part of our school who was the janitor in their school and just a wonderful until he retired and that's our uh, logo for our medicine wheel tools that uh, was designed by one of the kids uh, in the school so I'll be open for questions whenever you have any. All right, thanks, Lori. That was a that was a great presentation. Um, we've we've had one question here uh, so far. I'll just uh, just open this up as, a, as an opportunity for anyone else to start thinking about and and to start typing in those questions uh, that you may have thought of uh, during the presentation. The first question uh, that we had was from Christine, and she's just asking, how does one obtain the various medicine wheel tools? Um, and what I'll do uh, real quick is I'll just uh, uh, show the group. Uh, our uh, our knowledge exchange um, just really quickly while we have a while we wait for some more questions to come in. Um, so on the screen now, uh, you can see that the, this is the front page of the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. The URL is up at the top of the screen here, can.cafc.org. And there's a number of ways to get to the to the uh, FASD information. Right here in the middle is, of the categories list is the FASD screening tool uh, category. Um, there's also this tag cloud here, which are all of the various search terms and other terms that people have, have tagged the various pieces of content within the system with. You can see there's a tag for FASD. If you click that, that will just identify all pages that have been tagged with FASD. And also up at the top, there's a search uh, a search bar here, so you can just type in anything here. But in the, within the uh, FASD screening toolkit section, uh, these are all the listings of the various webinars. And this one here is the, is the actual toolkit, the CAFC screening toolkit one of the tools being the uh, uh, medicine wheel toolkit. So with it, within the toolkit page, there uh, there's a bit of information about the development of the screening tools. And then you'll see down here some of, some of the pieces of the medicine wheel toolkit. And as you go down, you can see a list of attachments down here at the bottom, um, which are the documents that have all of the uh, all of the various tools for all of the the um, the screening tools within CAFC's toolkit, the, the information about the meconium screening, the NST, the probation officers, tool, et cetera. Um, and you can see all of these medicine, all of these MW documents and the medicine wheel documents are, are all in there. Now, Laura, you may have uh, additional information. I'm not sure uh, that they can get uh, directly from uh, the Eastern Door Center website or maybe or, or anything else. Is there any other additional sources of information around the medicine wheel? Um, we're not very commercially oriented, I'm going to, uh, mostly people, researchers or folks have been just getting it from me by email, or that they'll just contact me and I'll try to get a printer to print up the difference game cards, or it's very, it's not done in any systematic way. Um, but if there's, you know, interest, uh, I think you have on the, on the, the uh, there's a contact number, I think, maybe on the, the tools there, I'm not sure, but they could, um, you know, through the Eastern Door, maybe we could put it up, I'll put up an address that they can get information uh, about the tools, and we could to open a discussion if people are interested. I know people are interested, but it's just hard with all the, everything, you know, to try to focus on that. It would be great if somebody was interested in doing it. <laughs> in producing it, it would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's uh, here's the page on the medicine wheel tool, the specific page. So maybe we can add some contact information for you. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
-hmm. Yeah, this this is where the actual recording of the webinar will appear in this resources section. We'll we'll put a link to the PowerPoint presentation that you just used, as well as to the uh, to the actual recording of the of the webinar. We'll put that will all appear here in this section in the middle of the page, and we'll also somewhere on here put some contact information. Okay, I might even put it on the I could put it on the uh, on the the uh, presentation at the end. Sure, that might be helpful as well. Yeah. yeah. Sure, a contact slide at the end would be very helpful, Lori. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we have had a couple of other questions come in. Um, Tanya uh, has asked, other than the elder on the diagnostic team, are all of the providers and interviewers Aboriginal? Well, no, not all of them. The um, health, our nurse practitioner is Aboriginal. Uh, our community, our Community coordinator was Aboriginal. She's now the position is vacant. Uh, if anybody wants to apply for it, actually, especially if they're Aboriginal, she's moved over into the school as our wellness coordinator. Um, the elder is Aboriginal. The family uh, support worker was Aboriginal. The uh, who else is on the team? And I think that's it. The physician is uh, is a is French from Quebec, the, um, and then the other folks are divergent, all different. So I guess it, I'm not sure how many folks there are, but a large percentage of the uh, people on the team are actually, you know, or there's a good percentage that are Aboriginal, but not all of them. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, is from Deborah, and she's uh, she's got a comment and a question. She, she says this is very similar to what uh, she is doing in Blackfoot country with the collaboration of their elders, community members, professionals, and agencies, etc. Uh, her question is in in your construction of the assessment tools, did you get input from the community teams? Um, in the construction of the. Uh, the two-eyed seeing tool and the trauma tool, I got a lot of input. Uh, in the construction of the original screening tool, that's the actual screening tool, I got input. It was inspired, really. It was similar. It was a similar kind of thing. It came from parent and teacher meetings and, of, and service professional meetings who were saying there's nothing that's getting to what the needs and gifts are. It's all this kind of piecemeal, you know, it's all like academic, and there's so many other things going on here. So it was just a matter of me trying to um, trying to find a way, a framework to hold it. And of course, the framework came that was a circular framework. And then in our community, we use the medicine wheel, so that's uh, the framework that was adapted. And so, and then we got more input from the scientific community and the elders there. And then the and the elders in the community in terms of adding things like the gifts, uh, adding in the beginning it didn't have in the developmental history for instance there wasn't uh, grief and, and abuse the uh, that was put in by the community like that felt that that might be a factor so yes it it's been a process of development. Um, Tony is also asking, has the medicine wheel tool been used outside of the school setting? And can you give an example, if there is one? Well, it's a school-based tool. It's, out, it's being used outside of Elsa Booktook in a few different communities, but it's a school-based tool. So not, not all the tools, but the screen, the FASD screening tools are used in that way. It's, um, a teacher perception. It goes through a whole school system. It, it uh, could be used in other small community systems, whether they would be, uh, that would be tight in, it, in and of itself. Like uh, you could say there's been interest, for instance, in using it in um, maybe one of the black communities in Halifax or uh, in, in northern Cape Breton in a, in a, a Gaelic uh, community. And um, where there's a tight sense of community, and they have that kind of a, approach to things, and they work together in, and in a community like that, but also where there's a lot of uh, multiple and complex issues. So I think it could be used uh, in, 
in different ways, but it, it's the window for it is from the school. There is a the there is a, a way to use it with the uh, the tool that I created for the kids that are out of school, which relies you go and you do an interview with a mom. That could actually be used if you wanted to use it without the school setting. You could use that as first stage screening with the uh, second stage screening. You've sort of uh, answered a little bit of this next question, I think, already. Um, but Deborah's asking, uh, the assessments that were designed, are they applicable to other First Nations populations? What do you mean the assessments that were de designed? The, the tools are, could be used in any, uh, like I said, yeah, they can be used. They, they have been used in other First, or are being used in other First Nation communities. And also, like I said, it, I, I haven't done them in other populations, but there's been interest, and I think they would work. Okay. Um, Elaine, you may also be able to answer this one, uh, and as well as you, Laurie. Um, Jean is asking, would it be possible to have the tool translated into French for use in uh, francophone communities? I know a lot of the content in the CAFC toolkit has been translated, but I'm not sure uh, specifically uh, about the medicine wheel. Well, the medicine wheel tools are translated, or they were, by the province. New Brunswick is a, is a uh, bilingual, it's one of the only bilingual provinces, maybe the only one. And um, the Provincial Department of Health translated the tools. But it may not be the latest version of the uh, screening tools, because remember, we, we worked on them somewhat uh, during the process right. to, we, we, you know, it's, they developed. So in terms of the scoring, uh, I think the, the tools that were uh, or have been translated into French have the old scoring uh, system, I think which is not really as, I would say, it's not really as good. Are you still there? Yeah, ab absolutely, Lori. I think what we can add to that for our, for our question is on the can, and perhaps, Doug, you can even uh, show folks uh, exactly where it is um, on the on our screen on our webinar. Um, <clears throat> the um, actual kit itself it doesn't involve every part of the medicine wheel tool, but as Doug is is showing us, there is a complete French translation of the actual kit. Um, the first I'll, I'll refer to it as the kit booklet. Um, which is quite comprehensive, and that is available on the net, on our Knowledge Exchange Network in both official languages. Is there a translation that you have a French of the of the the tool that you would administer? Parts of it is is translated, yes, Lori, and it, and it is it is on our Knowledge Exchange Network. Okay, that's yeah, that's good. And, and it is the most recent version of the tools. Oh, great, good. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking at that uh, at the at the uh, the toolkit entry, and as I, I just popped up one of the documents from the medicine wheel section that that has been translated, so you can see that that one is. But I, I just glancing through the list quickly, I don't think all of the uh, medicine wheel tools were have been translated, but that, there were a few of them were. Yeah, that's exactly right, Doug. The, the the core the core have been translated, and you'll find it there for you to access and download and print out on your own uh, from the Knowledge Exchange Network. It's not completely translated, though. I have, I have the up-to-date version of the difference game cards in French from the province and also the community development tool. So I can put, uh, we could try to get those available, too, if they and, want. And Lori, what we should do for everyone, certainly on our webinar today and for, our, you know, for a much larger um, uh, outreach, we can we can make those available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. That would be absolutely terrific. Okay, I'll do that. Doug, um, I, I have a question, Doug. If, yeah, uh, go ahead. If that's possible. Laura, you had mentioned that, um, toward the uh, the beginning of your presentation that you're currently working on a tool for earlier grades for younger children. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Because I'm certain that's of great interest to many. Well, in the, some of the communities that I've been working with, uh, really the Cree communities in the north, they asked me if I would develop a tool for 
that would be for pre you know that would be preschool. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'm. That's really what I want to do. I want to try to develop that. I want to try to use the basis of the. Uh, it would be the first stage, you know, the student index, but do it so that it would be effective or be suitable for, uh, say, daycare and Head Start. Excellent, excellent. Because we all know that that early intervention, you know, early screening leading to early diagnosis and and hence early intervention is 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 really a key to to a yes. better outcome. No no question there for sure. And I know that's a question that we've received um, on on a very very frequent basis. Lori, the the other the question and and just maybe discussion point I wanted you to if if you could um, just address. The uh, student index, and, and yes, this is a tool, the medicine wheel tool, is designed for the school system. Um, in terms of the teacher's, um, oh, for lack of a better word, and it really isn't the right word, but I'm going to say compliance or, you know, uptake, buy-in. Can you, can you sort of describe that process over time and, and, uh, and sort of the, the level of engagement? On behalf of uh, well, the, te the teachers uh, need to be trained in using it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't take very long. And at, you know, at first there's a little bit like anything new. I mean, you there's some they ask about it. You know, they it's unusual because most things are individual, and this is focused in in always looking at the individual in relation to the class or in relation to the school or the community. So it's a little bit different in the way that they fill it out, but they get the hang of it really quickly. I just did a, a uh, you know, I've been doing that for a couple of different communities and working with the teachers, and they don't seem to, you know, they get it. And then, so they get it after a while. It only takes a few hours. And I do a little bit, I do it with them the first time. Right. So that I actually do it with them there. I give them a little presentation. And what at the end of it, once they have, once they're doing it, once they've completed it, they're usually sold on it. They they start out kind of skeptical. Oh, here, here's something different. You know, here's something another thing that I have to do, another assessment. And they, but the end of it, they really seem to be, uh, you know, it seems to be okay with them. They seem that they are engaged. Okay. And then they they use it then for they just like in our school, they just start using it like every year. And at the end of the year, it's just normal practice. And um, they find it helpful. We find it helpful in all sorts of ways. And I'm looking at trying to get it so that it, it, the teachers can actually fill it out and then it goes into Excel so that then it's, it's done sort of by, you know, we can do it like a computer base. It becomes easier sure. for everyone. Sure. Okay. That's great. Uh, we've got a few more questions here, and this one's got an acronym that I'm sure I'm going to pronounce wrong, so I'll spell it out. Um, is, uh, Deborah's asking, uh, do you use the WISC-IV? So I'm not that not sure if you would call the WISC-4. Okay, yeah. the WISC-4, uh, and all the other neuropsych assessments as suggested for the diagnosis of FASD. Yeah, if you look at the... Yeah, if you look at the tool, the two I'd see, the screening is separate from assessment. So the screening tool is just like um, a net, you know, that's going to catch the kids that might have a problem, complex needs, or might have been affected by alcohol. And then we have to really look at them more closely. And during that assessment process, we use the, we're very, um, we use this, the four-digit process but it's, and very strictly we use it, you know, um, we really do engage in it and go through the four-digit process. But we use it in the context, if you looked at that circle, in the context of the traditional community and all of the other factors, not only that, that aren't just alcohol, but all of the other factors that might be influencing even how the alcohol might have affected the fetus, because not, every, not everybody who drinks is affected in the same, has their babies affected in the same way. And a lot has to do with the other risk factors that are really historical in that, or not, some of them might not be historical, but a lot of them are 
it, you know, even in terms of the alcohol. So you might have a mom who has very poor nutrition or who has been exposed to an environmental toxin as well as the alcohol. And so you have to consider all of those things in terms of how the alcohol has affected the child, nor, you know, sort of nor developmentally. And the, but the assessments themselves are the tools that look at the brain in, in a, and that the tool that, you know, Sterling Klein, the four-digit process is a wonderful, which is a wonderful tool. Susan Ashley and Sterling Klein's original, you know, four-digit tool, which is the underpinning of the Canadian guidelines. So yes, we do very, we do use the WISC. We use the, you know, um, the uh, WIPSI for the younger kids. We use the, uh, you know, the self for the, the, the uh, speech with you know, speech pathologists. We use that. The, we use the standard tools, you know, the sensory profile, um, all of the standard tools that are suggested by the Canadian guidelines. And, but we don't look at them in the same way. Because if you look at the tool, if you take just kind of a DSM-4 approach to using the WISC, you'll come out with an average, I, you know, you come out with an average ability level, you look at, you know, the sort of a, the verbal area, you know, the, the, the performance area, but you're not looking at, at what you might if you looked at the window, through the window of, of FASD, which is actually looking at the, the the subscale tests and how they how they relate together. So you see this pattern, this consistent pattern of inconsistencies in those in using those assessments. And you have to be careful, especially in the assessments and using a thing like the WISC four in a population that's a First Nation population. It can lead you astray unless you're looking at it uh, carefully within a cultural context. Um, it, the, you know, I have one, I had a big argument with somebody actually about one child who was coming through who's average, you know, who, when you do it, the sort of the classic WISC four way was coming out as being mentally challenged. And the, we, one of the, you know, specialists who really is not on the team, she was saying, oh, you have to break the news to the mother, you know, that this is a child that's, has, that's just, you know, mentally challenged. And yet when I did the, I, I did the Raven's Matrix, which is a non-verbal ability scale. The child's ability was absolutely average. And I, I could just tell that that was not a true reflection of the child by, you know, to say he was mentally challenged. And since he's, it's, he's proven like he's wonderful with like that intelligence in his hands, he just can do all sorts of things. He, he has difficulty with the verbal mode. I know this is a long discussion, but we really have to be careful how we use our standard psychometric uh, tools. But I think they need to be used, and we need to look at them, uh, just look at them with a with a uh, an eye that's you know an eye that's trained, you might say. Fantastic. Um, Val is asking uh, how soon this recording uh, of this session will be online. Uh, it usually takes us a few days to get it online. I do have to admit I'm uh, off for a couple of days next week on vacation, but uh, it should be up, uh, give me till the following Monday, so a week from Monday, and, and it should be up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. I usually do send an email around to all of the uh, participants of the webinar to let them know that it's up so that they can forward the link on to any of their colleagues that they think would be interested in this. Um, Lori, this next question is, is quite long, so uh, I'll give you some warning. It's going to take me a little bit to read all the way through it. Um, but uh, Richard has asked, or he's com commented and asked, he's, he's saying some folks are asking the youth and adult forensic psychiatric services in BC and elsewhere to consider incorporating FASD information into the court-ordered and non-court-ordered psych assessments and counseling that they're currently doing as they have not done this in the past, although they have incorporated some basic FASD information into their assessments. Could they perhaps contact the program about how to do this? You mean to contact uh, my program, like the medicine uh, wheel? I, I think that's he's, he's also sort of given a follow-up, so I'll, uh, a, a second sort of question that I think is sort of part of this. So I'll, I, I think that's what he's meaning, is, is, he, is, is perhaps contacting you guys to see how they could go about incorporating this into their, into the, into their assessments for the court-ordered types of assessments. Uh, um, but he's also he's also uh, saying that this includes Aboriginal knowledge being incorporated into the forensic work that they do. 
Well, I, I think it's, you know, it would be real important to include, to have that way of looking and perhaps to use the, uh, tool, the tool, the trauma tool, I think would be appropriate. And also the, the two I've seen diagnostic tool would be appropriate. The, I think the school screening tool would not be. The developmental history might, if you had a youth, uh, you know. Uh, but um, I think those two tools would definitely be appropriate to, uh, you know, and I do, I definitely agree with him that it should be included, or agree with whoever saying it, that it should be included in the court order, uh, you know, forensic uh, assessment. Because we know from the research that, uh, you know, a high, a high percentage of, of youth and adults in the correction system may have FASD. And the one study that was done, it was of the kids who were referred to forensic psychiatry, it was, you know, 24% or something. Julie Conroy did that study. So, I mean, there is a need for FASD in the assessment, and definitely in terms of uh, looking at it from a cultural, you know, for folks that are from First Nations, I think it would be a good discussion uh, to have in how that, that, you know, and maybe you'd want to look at, you know, you'd want to maybe look at using these, something like these tools that came from the elders, really, like, and I was, it was just such a blessing that they have given us, like, so much of the, um, you know, really, in terms of the development of the tools, they've really been uh, just there to give their uh, way of looking. It's more their, their way of looking, you know. Um, and the same is true for the scientific elders. I think it's, it's so interesting. Like, you have these combining the two, like Medina Marshall said, is so amazing. So I, I, I think we should do the same myself for, I think Richard is right, mm -hmm. for forensics, you know, the forensic assessment of FASD. And in, in addition uh, to what Lori has, has shared with us, uh, it's Elaine again, I, I think to Richard's question, one of the things that we can do, and, and maybe I would, I would actually encourage Richard to start a little bit of a dialogue through the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, and we can bring folks, um, our colleagues at the Asante Center, yeah. looking specifically at our probation officer tool, um, I think there there are many resources and um, and and um, aid that that we can provide through our greater team um, to to help Richard to help you out, Richard, in in terms of the work that you're you're proposing for going yeah. forward. You know, somebody like uh, well, first of all, again, Julie Conry, as as um, Lori mentioned, uh, Ab Chutley is is another individual yeah. who's actually doing this kind of thing within the province of Manitoba. So there's a lot that we can bring to this question. It's an excellent question. Okay, well, we're, we've uh, we've just gone past our our scheduled time, our scheduled end time of two thirty. We do have one more uh, question left that I'll throw out. Uh, and it is, I, should, I think it's a fairly simple one. Uh, how time, uh, Carolyn's asking, how time intensive is it to complete this to, uh, the tool? Well, the student index, the school tool takes, after the teachers know how to do it, it only takes 15 minutes to complete it for the teachers. Then there's a period to co collate it that needs to be done that takes a bit longer because, of course, you don't just, the screening happens, but you have to, like, sort of score it, you might say, and get not only the kids to F the FASD diagnostic, diagnostic services and referral, but also the other referrals that would take place. That's why I want to do it in some sort of like Excel program or something. That might take another hour for the whole school. It doesn't take that long, really. But the develop the stage two, uh, the stage two screening for uh, with the developmental history takes a bit of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you really need that part of it becomes the intake for the uh, diagnostic process or can become the intake and you, you form the relationship with the mom and, and she tells you her story and so you have to take your time with that. It takes us, it can take up to a couple of hours or two and a half hours. You get very close. It can, it can be shorter depending on the mom. But you, you, you know, that's, 
you put that time in. It's worth it in the end. And then they, they come on board for the whole, at the whole process. All right, thanks. Um, and Richard also said thank you as well uh, as a comment back, so I, it appears as though we've answered his question. Um, but as, uh, as Elaine said, Richard, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us, and we can uh, certainly continue that discussion on further. Uh, that's all the questions that we have, Elaine, uh, so I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Doug. And uh, let, me, let me close, first of all, by, by thanking Lori. Lori, it, this was a tremendous discussion, tremendous presentation, and thank you for all of your time, work, and effort today and, and for many, many, many years uh, of, of work in this very, very important area. Um, I want to thank our participants for your questions, for your active engagement in, in the discussion. Um, I want to just mention that, um, you know, the dialogue does not have to end today. The Knowledge Exchange Network is an opportunity for us to continue to dialogue online. It is monitored regularly. Doug is the lead of CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. And, and we really encourage you to, A, visit Ken um, and bring us your comments. And again, Richard's question is a, it is a great example of how we can continue to provide information and resources to you. I want to mention that September the 12th is our sixth and final webinar for this series. We are going to continue uh, our webinars um, around FASD uh, well into 2012, but uh, September 12th will mark the closure of the first webinar series. And that one is going to focus on the ethics and the place for meconium testing um, as part of our national screening toolkit. Um, leaders um, within that webinar will be Dr. Stuart McLeod from the University of BC, uh, Dr. Gideon Corrin from Mother Risk Program in the University of Toronto. Uh, we will also be welcoming um, additional presenters, uh, Bernard Dickens, um, who is a um, special, specialist in law and criminology, uh, Professor Emeritus um, Health and Law and Policy at the University of uh, Toronto. We're going to be welcoming to that September 12th as well, Suzanne Tuff, who is a professor with the Faculty of Medicine, University of Calgary. Uh, Anna Zudnowski, who is Calgary, who is a Calgary-based ethicist lawyer, will be joining us as well, Joey Guerreri who is the manager of the Mother Risk Laboratory at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, uh, Dr. Momita Sakar, um, who uh, is actually in transition from the University of Toron uh, Toronto to uh, Dalhousie University, and finally, um, Dr. Cap uh, Catherine Bigsby uh, from the University of PEI and Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Charlottetown uh, will be joining us on that September 12th panel. It promises to be extremely, um, again, interactive, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to engage all of our participants. And we, in, we invite and encourage you all to come and join us for that September 12th webinar, and uh, you will be receiving notifications. Hi, at, at this point, again, I want to thank Lori. I want to thank Doug for his continu continued leadership uh, yeah. in all of our webinar work. And uh, I'd like to wish everyone a wonderful summer, a safe and happy summer, and happy Canada Day to all. Thank you all. Bye-bye now.